This session is brought to you by Zurich Life and Investments. These guys are one of the last true independent life insurers going around and they're Swiss, so you know their stuff is solid. These guys really understand and believe in the value of advice, which is why they invest in programs like this one and partner with groups like XY Advisor to help drive the positive evolution of financial advice in Australia. Their team are just really good people as well. So if you haven't already connected with them to learn more, check out their website or speak to your business development contact. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund, as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments, they're really, really cheap, and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout because they're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, welcome to Paul Mann. How are you, mate? Yeah, not bad. Hi, how are you, mate? <laughs> so uh, we hear that you're um, managing the Future Fund. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, same name, different person. <laughs> right. uh, easy mistake. Right. Um, yeah. I am good with money, but maybe uh, no one's given me quite that bills, much. Bills, yeah. Um, yeah. The funds under management aren't quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, have, there. you have recently started a business though, right? Brand new. Yep. Uh, brand new. Yeah, I uh, started it... Um, we only got uh, authorised in November, so 2017, so a few months in. Yeah. Uh, it's been an exciting ride. Um, at the stage of my life where um, it was time to do it or not, make a decision mm. to take that step to run my own business. Um, I've run businesses for, for a long time. I've been an advisor, a licensed advisor for 18 years now. Wow. Um, so I've good, seen... Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot, uh, a lot of change and a lot of things come and go, but uh, I felt like it was the right environment, scarily enough, to start a business. Um, May I ask, I'm kind of interested, 18 years ago, what was the industry like? I mean, obviously we hear the... Apart from can the, you remember much of it? <laughs> <laughs> so I Apart can remember the first it. class train ride to be like the Colorado Rockies from... Uh, well, I think that's the perception, but I mean, you know, I imagine... It's, it's I'm kind sure of that happened. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> look, I, I can tell you that. And look, I, I suppose a bit of background on myself. I, I was in uh, financial markets, so my, my first job... Um, was a chalky on the stock exchange. So, um, wow. yeah, I was, I was very young. Um, yeah, so back then, you know, open outcry, and uh, and I loved the adrenaline of it. I loved the uh, the pace, and and it really taught me about financial markets from the, the ground up. Like when you get that grounding in it, you understand risk, you understand movements, things like that. So, I did that for a little while, and then moved into futures trading. So I was on the open outcry futures floor for for ten years uh, in Sydney and in London, uh, working for companies like ABN AMRO and Bankers Trust. And, but uh, the environment, and, and this is about, I suppose, being relevant and also uh, checking in with yourself and making sure you're doing what you're comfortable with. The trading floor, the open outcry uh, systems closed down and they all went on to, to screens. Now, I was an excellent floor trader. Um, I'll give myself a rap here, but I, <laughs> you know, I ran big books for big companies um, and, and did it well. But as a screen trader, uh, staring at numbers moving all day with, without the, the noise and, and the emotion, um, oh, I found myself, right. I was a dinosaur at 30 years of age. Whoa. Going, and, and I was very successful at this, and I went, okay, what do I do now? I tried it on a desk. I, mm. I tried trading for myself for a while. So I, I was what was called a local back then. So I was trading my own money. Uh, I found that very unfulfilling. Um, making money for the sake of making money, mm. um, not adding anything back into um, the system or, or into yeah. the community. Um, and did I had you a, chalk when you were doing it for yourself. Yeah, I'm going to learn about this. Yeah, yeah. How like, does that work? Just, just for no, no, I was though. trading for myself, so I was. Um, yeah, I had I had some capital and uh, I had a, an account um, with a with a with a brokerage. I suppose you'd call it. It was actually you know a licensed futures trader, and I was trading interest rates. So I was trading predominantly three year and ten year interest rate. So at the end futures. of the day, you've got a stack of receipts, and you give that to the. No, it no? was all on, it was all online. No, well, beforehand when you were when oh you were, beforehand yeah, when when I was, doing the hand things and <laughs> yeah okay yeah that was very different. So the yeah, open yeah. outcry it's it's like a big uh, auction. Okay. Okay, so that's what it is, and it's just multiple things getting sold everywhere. Yeah, well, you you're in a pit. In those pits used to be so there was a ten year. 
pit, but they had different months. So oh, the months right. to expiry right. for the different. So a lot of it was about shouting, but there was also the, a lot of hand signals. So you would you know, buy and sell. And Did you use your sort of presence from karate? Oh, <laughs> right. I, wasn't, I didn't do karate then, but <laughs> oh. um, you did. Look, it took a long time to train up and to build presence and to build. Um, Build a reputation as well, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Nice. and you had to cl- think very, very quickly. It was all about quick thinking. And yeah, you're right. So what you'd do is buy and sell. You'd write it down as you go, and there would be the seller had to write out a sales cheat. So the seller would would sell it and give it to the buyer, and, and that's the way it worked. Right. So there'd be one copy for you, one copy for them, and one copy for the exchange. Um, <laughs> And any trade had to be announced to the pit. There was a pit boss in there who, who registered the trade, so people sort of knew you. where where it was. So it was organised chaos. Yeah, it was very organised, very very strict rules um, that everyone. So so to become a, a, a white badge trader was you had to go through exams. You had to to be you know be trained up. You're a mm-hmm. yellow badge, a red badge first. Couldn't weren't allowed in the pit. A yellow badge was a trainee, usually a backup. So. It wasn't just me in the pit, it was myself and my backup who was taking the orders and, and sure. feeding the information back and forth. Who would perhaps have a relationship with like a portfolio manager or a hedge well, so, fund? So there was brokers, so it was, it was a brokerage firm and yeah. so the brokers were on the phones on the, on the trading floor and they'd be talking to yeah all manner of clients who were using, predominantly, look, there, there was a, you were either hedging your bond book or you were, you were, you were taking positions and, and having a punt, I suppose, you know. Um, so, and, and there was different types of people and different firms attacked. You know, that would have been heaps of, of fun. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. look, I was 20 years of age, you know, tw- oh, that was in my 20s. I was overpaid and <laughs> uh, had a ball. It, 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 was, it was a big boys club. It yeah. was. Uh, it this was, was the 90s? Club. This was the 90s. Yeah. So from 99 to 2000, that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> spent three years doing it in London as well with Bankers Trust. I moved over there and um, that was... Whew, Five times the size, and mm. it was huge, and that was that was quite scary when I went over there. But uh, I wanted to go travelling, but instead of just packing up and backpacking, I thought, well, I'll do it properly, and lived in London and, awesome. and worked. And so yeah, but it gave me such a good grounding in markets and things like that. Um, yeah, and so, uh, so now that when fun. clients come in, you, you, you yell at them and throw bits of paper at the door. I'll tell you what, I, I, I really had to. Uh, <laughs> And, and you laugh. I was, I was very, you know, people on the trading floor, all the people that, that knew me, I thought I was very aggressive, right? And you know me, I'm not an aggressive person, but you had to be. Assertive. Mm, you had to be. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you had to be aggressive, to be honest, because if you okay. got left out of a trade, well, you had to fight for that trade. Because if you missed your, your price, then mm. that's mm. the reputation of you as a trader. Because if you couldn't fulfil yep. what you were there for, well, yep. you're out. It was yep. cutthroat. Yeah, and that's what the broker. You know, they want to get the best prices. So, and a lot of the time, you would um, you would fill an order and just go, "Yeah, you're done," and then work on it to get a better fill, so you could come back to you and go, "Yeah, I've got some better prices for you." And and uh, yeah, that was an intimate no- knowledge of the market and, and yeah, the movement well. and knowing what was going on. And it was all it was it was like reading a crowd. You know, the, the, mm. taking the temperature of the crowd, what was wow. going on, knowing where other people's positions were, knowing that there might have been a a local or an independent trader there who was well out of their depth and <laughs> yep. had to get out and yep. you were there going, okay, well, they need to sell at mm, some stage or mm, it's going down. Mm. Where's their stop loss going to be? And picking up a bargain. and yep. or, Nice. Or yeah. also stuffing it up totally, which, trust me, <laughs> happened often and going, how am I going to dig myself out of this? Ooh. Mm. And face that many a time and that's when you really find yourself it's really interesting because you know now if you buy a buy or sell stock you see the depth of the market but you can't see the fifth fifth sell order that's a a sweating uh, portfolio manager that will take any price and right. it's just exactly you know, right. but, you know if you're there and you can see him well it's quite apt <laughs> you know you look at the the fear in the market the last couple of days yeah um and, and the volatility coming back into the market and that's mm. it's not based on Facts and figures. It's based on emotion. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Are totally we talking? Are we talking about the crypto market? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> please, just... please don't. Let's talk about real markets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you know there's a VIX ETF, which is the volatility index, course, yeah. that broke as a result of the? I did. Yeah. I, so I looked at this right, mm. and it wasn't that high. It, it, it reached. Uh, I don't know if you follow much, but it only reached about thirty. I don't know how it broke at 30. Because well, it, it, it calibrated, because there's been no volatility, it's just been consistent. So it's calibrated itself to a, a really base level. So once it, 
because that that it turned like that. So right, yeah. the, the, you know, and and people build these systems, but they don't actually go back far enough and stress test them. They just think this is what it's going to be like. Because two thousand and eight, it was about a hundred and something. Right? Yeah, I think the Vix come in after that. No, did oh, I was watching right. it every day oh. as it was happening. Okay. I was like, holy shit! Maybe this Vix ETF though. Yeah, but two thousand eight right. compared to the other day, it was the biggest drop in the Dow. In history, so yeah, and that's where it is. It, it, it's it's relative, but it's also record highs. So totally. coming off level yeah. highs to a yeah. to a different level, yeah, just you know that that's where it comes from, and, and yeah. it, it's all relative, you know. Yeah, Bitcoin yeah. went down a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what is Bitcoin? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, so Paul, I know. I know. Paul, just, t- tell us about this, this so, your business. Oh, okay. Well, I was telling a story, wasn't I? I started oh, getting right? a bit long-winded. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, no, you tell us where you came from. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, I, just... I, I, was, I found myself a dinosaur at 30 and went, well, I need to do something different. I need to reinvent myself. And what am I going to do? Um, which was challenging. Um, and I had a cousin who was a, um, a financial advisor. He's still a, a financial advisor with, uh, in the CBA network. And... Um, He's, he, he always said to me, Paul, you'd be good at this. Paul, you'd be good at this. So I started doing a few of the old the DFPs back in the day, they were called, um, you know, number one and two, and yeah. just started studying and went, okay. And so I got my jo- myself a job um, as a branch financial advisor at a, at a banking institution, which Ooh. I will rename, remain nameless, and uh, earning uh, probably a quarter of what I used to earn. Ooh. So that and that's a big step. So I actually Ooh. reinvented myself down to the base level, took a base entry level job as a as a financial advisor. And you talk about what was it like back then. So this was two thousand. I was in one branch um, in the city, uh, and I had one investment book or well, investment products. So there was a income fund, an income growth fund, an Australian equities fund, and a uh, international equities fund. That's all I had. And Life TB, t- TPD, and, uh, and an IP policy in another book. Uh, there was no SOAs. There was no nothing like that. Um, I had a limit. I could only invest up to two hundred thousand, or actually a hundred thousand. I think it was at the start um, for people. And it was really about talking to people about, well, do you really need that term deposit? You know, maybe we should be putting you into a managed fund. Three percent entry fee. Three percent ongoing. Mm. Oh. Ongoing. Three percent entry fee, three percent ongoing. That was the fees, but that was normal back mm. then. That's what it was. <sighs> um, that is so heavy. Oh, it's just rude. Outrageous. But that's what it was, and um, it look it was challenging from a values and, and point of view because you know it, the sales culture was there. It was a sales culture, yeah, and there was you know these. Um, you know, hit list of you know people selling the most, and and you know, mm. how are they doing that, and all this sort of stuff. And, and I was I didn't get into financial advice to to make money. I got into um, to, to to do something for the long term. I wanted to help people, and I know this is a very cliched piece, but that's why I got into it. Mm. I wanted to use my skills and to build myself a career where I could make a difference with with the knowledge that I had. Um, I always think if you find the right industry and you do well at it, you will be remunerated appropriately. Totally. Um, that's the way it works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you just got to be good at it. So the, what it did teach me was how to sit down and talk to people. Without yelling at them. <laughs> As I said, I, I had to really change myself. I mm. was this angry, sort of, you know, aggressive futures trader. I had to yeah. turn myself into... Talking to to to, to mum you know, and dad, I, yeah, mums and dads, older people, yeah, everyone, and just be able to get them to open up and talk to me about their lives and how, what, what how they wanted to achieve. How did you stop yourself having a really strong view about what the portfolio managers were doing in the managed funds? So <laughs> yeah. I imagine that would be tricky, right? You're like, oh yeah. Look, I still got that. I still got views. You know, yeah. I met a couple of asset managers yesterday, and I've I've got my certain views, and it's built from you know, 25 years of industry knowledge. And I actually enjoy, and I spoke to a, a yeah, a, 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 I suppose a relationship manager or whatever they're called these days, um, and said, look, I'll never invest money in a fund unless I actually meet the fund manager. I need to see how they tick and what they what they wow. do. So, yep. yeah, yeah, I never, I will never do that. And I, every in, in fund I've invested in for, for people, I've, I've met the manager and, and spoken to them. Wow. Um, so... 
you can't get that out of yourself. I have got a view, um, and I use it. But what I do is also the when we're talking to people about their money, we're, we're talking about long term. And um, if I've got a day to day view on it, it's going to cloud what I'm trying to do yeah. for for a client, which is not. Look, let's be honest. You know, whether you're trying to add alpha, you know, gain alpha or. or, or well, really, it's not. You're just getting people into an asset class that'll have growth. Sure. So, mm. as an advisor, rather than talking about the the day trading aspect, it's more an asset allocation. Absolutely. You know, I would rather sit and you know Clayton knows this. I would rather sit there and talk to someone about solving their cash cash flow. That's the day to day. That's how they mm-hmm. work. That that's the biggest mm-hmm. challenge in people's lives. Not whether the market's going up or down. You know, you pay professionals to do that. You make sure they they're good at it. Three percent. <laughs> well, look, that's my dark past. You know? and, that's, and, and you, know, you asked the question. No, 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 I don't think it's your past. Oh, no, no, look, no, that's the, the industry's pro- past. Yeah, correct. And then that's, that's some oh, of the man, challenges. 20 years, people have been going, how the hell did you sell 0.5 MERs <laughs> on ETFs? Yeah, probably, yeah. How did you charge ongoing fees? <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's going to be the next one. I'm getting off that high horse. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's about talking and caring for your client now. That's how I see it. It's not about me trying to pick the market because mm-hmm. I can't. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I always, uh, my, the person who trained me up to be a, a futures trader, he used to talk about the comet and try, you know, the, the best thing you can ever be in a market is on the tail of the comet. You can never capture the comet. You can get that, that yeah, view. Yeah, momentum. Yeah, yeah, right yeah so, you know, if you can catch the tail, which regularly is really hard to do. If you can get a ride on the tail for a little while, you'll make money. Definitely. But you can never capture the comment. Mm. You've got to just get on that totally. tail. Totally. Yeah, yeah. That's and a really too many point. people, it's gone and they're like, oh, no, yeah. that comment's gone. You know? And mm. that's, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If you can jump on the tail, but now, yeah, too yeah. many people got in too late. But yeah, that, that just happens over and over anyway in history. So as an as a ex-futures trader then, what does looking after your client mean if the investment piece is outsourced to a, an investment manager and then you're the advisor there with that skill set but, but looking to offer something different? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, um, so I worked for banks for, a couple of, for about four years and then I stumbled across this company called Moneywise Global, um, which was owned by Flight Centre, a very um, uh, forward-thinking company. Mm. And they actually um, provided financial advice to their staff uh, for free, uh, in-house, uh, as a staff benefit. So I joined that thinking this is why I got into financial advice. It was about delivering on, or delivering on a staff benefit but meeting the needs of the person in front of you at the time without um, having any uh, bias towards, well, I've got to sell something to hit a target, I've got to get fun, I've got to get you know, insurance commission, those sorts of things. This was about providing uh, a service to that person in front of you mm-hmm. um, where and meeting them where they're at. And that, that's a big thing, meeting the person where they're at, not trying to force your opinion on them. <laughs> so I've that, that really uh, formed, you know, I was like, uh, formed, that really uh, crystallised why I got into financial advice. And I was able to deliver a service to these people. And, you know, Flight Centre doesn't have an old, like, they're, they're 28 and female. That's the, the basic demographics of the company. Tough gig. <laughs> <laughs> and, look, oh, yeah, it was, it was a great, it was a great, you know what? It was a great job for a very long time. And, yeah. and I started as a, just as in New South Wales, you know, just, uh, just running the state by myself, ended up, you know, growing it. And there was eight people in the whole business and, Ended up become you know, running it, and we built it into sixty five people around the world, and you know around the world. Yeah, yeah. well, so New Zealand, Canada, US. Is there uh, flight centre over there? Oh, flight centres everywhere. Yeah, mm. great, great conferences. Yes, really? I can, oh mate, Absolute I can tell you carnival. some stories, but uh, not 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 in on on this in this forum. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so it, in terms of my beliefs, in terms of financial advice, and what I deliver, and, and what you know, myself and my business partner are now delivering. Um, it is about meeting the person where they're at, with no uh, agendas and uh, and no um, formula, if that makes sense. I haven't got a system where you come in and I'll put you through the system. What we do is sit there and go, well, 
what do you want to do? You yeah. know, and, and discover goals for people. And I know, again, this is cliched, but getting that from people um, is the hardest thing. Yeah. What do you want to achieve? You know, and, and even highlighting the fact that a lot of the, the, the stress they face in their life is financially founded. Yep. Um, you know, I've seen marriages break up, I've seen all, and mm -hmm. people have no, uh, um, no idea how that happened. <clears throat> and you say to them, well, what did you used to argue about? And they go, oh, well, she spent too much and he did this and he was gambling or whatever it was, but it was financially based. So yep. if you can build a system for people and a structure for people that works for them, takes the stress out of them, get them talking about their money. Yep, remove the taboo. Absolutely. Open it up, make it into a normal conversation, challenge them to change what they're currently doing because it'll be better, put a structure in place that suits them and works for them, the rest will come. And then you can start investing their money in the right asset classes and mm. all that. But if you solve that piece for them, and I've done this with people who, you know, who are 20 and have no money, but I've also done it with people who are in their 50s who mm. have assets everywhere and they still are arguing about the exact same thing and stressing about this, that day-to-day that -day life and yeah. those skills that no one teaches us. So you, you're kind of touching on something that's really strong on in, in my my heart when it comes to so it, it's a psychology or a you know that's that's the value proposition. Yeah, the psychology of money. I mean, look, the, the, it's it's really becoming a thing. Obviously, I mean, I've yeah. been we've been doing this for for a long time. Um, for me, the the central part of it is awareness. Mm -hmm. If you make people aware that they've got an issue mm. and that that and and that there's a, a way to solve it, then all of, all of a sudden you're opening a door that they've never been through and you become that trusted person in their life um, that they will you know, come back to again and again to, to, to look after them. Even once you've solved all their problems and put them on the road, you're that, and I equate this, you're, you're that trusted teacher. Now, obviously you guys all went to school. Um, I would challenge people, think of a teacher, think of how many teachers you had during your schooling period. There's probably one or two that you clicked with. That was it. Mm. And I'm not disparaging yeah, yeah, yeah. teachers. My, my, my fiance's a teacher and she's a great teacher. But um, it, that one teacher did something that connected with you. Yeah. And I would say that 20 years later you'd go back and if they said, go and do that, you would do it because you trust them intimately. Mm. Um, that's that's what you you become. You become that trusted teacher, that person who's taken them from from darkness to light, holding their hand properly. Mm. And all of a sudden, you, you don't have to worry about um, convincing them about investment markets and things like that. All you have to do is take them further on that journey and open their mind uh, to, to to further parts. So the 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 the, the the thing there, though, is with great responsibility, you know, with, with that trust comes great re responsibility. So you mm. have to deliver on it and you have to be true to your word mm. and you have to have, you know, extremely high morals and uh, and, and deliver over the years. And, and that that's about building a reputation and, and a career um, and, a, and a business, you know. And that's uh, what I did at, at Money Wise and, and I suppose I've moved into and just started my, my own business. It's actually half mine of... Yeah. My two I see from, from Money Wise has come with me, Kath Navarro, and uh, so we've worked together for, for 11 years, and uh, we just decided to, to do it ourselves. And um, so what was the process, Paul, in that you, you decided, you come up with the idea, what happened after that? What was the steps in the, in the planning process? <sighs> yeah, look, uh, <laughs> so I left, my, uh, I left Flight Centre end of May, uh, 17, so almost a year ago. Wow. Um, a lot of changes there, and uh, it was time for me to go. And because um, you were there for eighteen years, no, no, I was there for thirteen years. Thirteen years, sorry, thirteen yeah. years. Um, and I took a break, to be honest, Ben. I I needed to let a lot of things go. I was running a really big business, and there was a lot of staff, and there was a lot of stress. And uh, again, like I, I suppose, I found myself after futures trading. I found myself in the same predicament mm. um you know i had a, had a lot of in it had a lot of uh, emotion I was, I was living on on you know cortisol and those types of things it was just it was a very 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 high paced role so i had to rediscover myself and i suppose kath found the same um herself in the same situation so i took some time out 
just to reassess what I really wanted to do in this industry. I knew I wanted to be in financial services. I, I, I love this industry. It's got its challenges, but at the heart of it, it, it's, it does good work for, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I had to discover what I wanted to do. I looked around. I know a lot of people. I talked to a lot of people. Um, was offered a few different roles in different uh, corporates, um, but I just didn't... I didn't want to fight with everyone all the time, and that's what I was finding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, that's a knowing laugh. I, I was fighting every day, and, and all I could see myself in these other institutions, um, I, I, I hate bureaucracy, and I will fight against as much as possible. Yeah. And uh, so I, was, I just thought, you know what? So to be honest, Kath and I had a coffee. Um, we sat down, and, I, and we talked about it over the years. You know, you do. When you work closely with someone, you go, well we could do this for ourselves. And that was probably always our backup plan for, for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so, it, Ben, it was as simple as, uh, and me saying, well, okay, well, what does it look like? We uh, sat in my, uh, in my dining room, got a whiteboard together and just started putting it out there. And, and we'd worked on a, on a business. We built a business uh, over the last 10 years. So, so we know the steps to do it, you know, and, and it's about having purpose, um, and if you go to our website, um, you know, our purpose is there and our beliefs. We sat down and said, what do we believe in? What do we want to do? What does it look like? So we've got a purpose there and we've got a set, I think there's about eight, maybe ten beliefs and what we believe in. And that's the basis of the business. Um, it's almost like our, our Magna Carta or, or mm. our constitution. Mm. So the decisions we make about the business and how we want to act and how we want to grow have to be okay by the beliefs. And if they're not, then are we compromising our beliefs or have we got the beliefs wrong? Do we need to revisit those? Now, I've revisited those uh, for the last eight months and um, I haven't, we haven't changed a word. So it was, it's about just having that heart. You know, and, and I, you can think, you know, it, it, how do I say this? There's a balance between um, y your mind and your heart. And it's about really not overthinking things. And, and trying to just be all about your mind, that's about bringing your heart into it. That's sure. the key. You know, if yeah. you if you can balance your heart and mind, um, then you can really harness a lot of energy because you're in balance. Um, and it, it, it's a very much a male thing, um, having not enough what heart. Do you mean? Yeah. No. Well, no. Uh, it's true. And and I look, I've done a lot of work. I, I've had you know mentors and things over the years, and and a lot of them. And I suppose working in a predominantly female company at, at Flight Centre um, really encouraged me to, to open that piece and make sure that I was balanced in that way because if you were too blokey, um, yeah, it point. wasn't going to work. Yep. And you, you end up telling people instead of listening and, and, and balancing yourself out. Yeah. So it's having that, that heart and mind balance um, that, that really, you know, then, then you know... You, the, the, the centre of your business or, or your true purposes and beliefs mm -hmm. are right. So you've got sure. to question that. And, and it's great having, having a female, um, you know, a business partner as well because yeah. you know, the yang and, and all that sort of stuff just yeah. balances out and makes sure, okay, because we're not, I'm not targeting a, a, a male audience, I'm, I'm targeting a human yeah. audience. Yeah. Mm. So how do you, so you, you want to set up, so you've got the heart, you've got the beliefs, you've got the values in the business, but then from that point, how did, how did you... Like, what was the process you went through to decide who you were going to work with and what sort of stuff you were going to do? Yeah. So that was all part of the, the initial process. What, what does this business look like? Now, um, and, and look, I suppose the most important thing, Ben, is where do you get your clients? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the key, okay? That's whether you align yourself w with accountants, whether you're marketing, well, how, how you, you know, where do you get your clients is the heart of that, that question. Mm -hmm. um, so we were in the corporate what, what used to be, I suppose, or what, what used to be defined as the corporate super space. Okay, that, that's what Money Wise predominantly did. It worked. When, when you're dealing with 20-somethings, they don't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they've all got super. So having a great financial conversation with them was, well, let's do a budget and let's organise your super. Mm. And the amount of you know, future value that business add, has added uh, uh, to, to the staff of Flight Centre over the, over the next 40 years mm. will be phenomenal just by putting them into the right asset class and, and yeah. opening that up. So we did that really well. So obviously, Kath and I 
when we've started this business, we've gone, well, that's the space we want to be in. But I don't actually define it as corporate super. That that's that, that, Those days are old. Um, for me, it's it's about um, corporate financial wellness, mm-hmm. um, for lack of a better label, yeah. um, and uh, wrapped up as a staff benefit. Yeah, which, so is, it, which is huge, right? Because I think, I think businesses, corporates especially, are getting better at understanding that uh, to simply pay your staff more doesn't necessarily no. fix anything or create intrinsic motivations. Often, if people aren't looking after their finances and aren't aligned to what they're doing, it can actually be a bit of fuel to fire. Oh, massively! And 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 the lack of uh, the, the lack of financial literacy in modern day society mm. is is quite scary, and we we all know that. Um, the the manifestation of it is is obviously stress and adverse behaviour um, that isn't just at home. The amount of people who sit at work worrying about the bills they've got to pay and yep. you know, the very basics is, is phenomenal and the, the loss of productivity to companies yep. based on that. Um, yeah, it's huge. Absolutely. And, and look, companies offer you know uh, counselling services and gyms and, and they really focus on the physical health of people. They're, they're much more getting into the mental health of people. But the challenge there is a lot of those manifestations are caused by financial stress. Mm, definitely. You know, especially, you know, under 45, um, you'll find 50% of the stress that's caused in people is financially based. That's really interesting. So if we've got a problem where mental health is blowing out of proportion and a massive segment of that is financial, then, yeah, it's kind the, of the, amount of clients the way you put it. The amount of clients I've dealt with over the last, you know, how many years um, that all of a sudden their whole life changes just because we, we structure their budget correctly. Mm. Yeah, it's huge. Very, very simple process. It has far reaching and, and it's and it's beyond, you know, the thing you're also building there is if future generations of financial literacy because in my experience, if your parents were good at it, you are. Yep. But so mm. all of a sudden, <clears throat> if you instill that into them, get them working, their children, generations will be improved. I, I find um, if I because obviously this is our world and, and you try to come up with ways, uh, frameworks to make things easy for people to understand. And I think um, people are overly engaged or overly emotionally attached to their cash flow and under-engaged and under-emotionally attached with super. And I think the reason is... Absolutely. I think the reason is because there's no separation. There's no, there's no layers between you and your cash flow, but there's a bunch of layers mm. between you and your, and your super. So I... F- I th- I feel that the best way to fix a budget is to add in layers, invent it or not. In, but but if you can disconnect someone from them, mm. their salary, you're going to get a better response. And then if you can reduce and engage people in, in, in their money for the long term, then you get better results. And it's so weird because they're so opposite. One's mm. overly emotional and the other one's under emotional. And then as an advisor, we can sort of, level that out to yeah. get better results on both playing fields. Oh, Someone oh. yesterday referred to uh, super super money as uh, monopoly money. Yeah, you know, what it, the it, fuck it, it, is that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. I've always said to people, it's your money, you just can't spend it for a while. Yeah, so there's a lot you can do with it. It's just you, you, one thing you can't it. do with it, is spend it. And, and I think the way I've always explained that is is having, you know, time, that, and, and this is, you know, something I learned back in the old days is... is about talking about time frames and, and the appropriate appropriateness of different investments for time frames. I used to do a, well, and still do. A, if I need to really educate someone, I'll run them through a scenario over time of investing in bonds or, or term deposits, especially versus um, the share market, and just what if? What if you'd put this much money in that for mm. the next for ten years? And and you know it's really easy. You, you you need to learn this, but there's some really easy scenarios. And if you know some good share stories, i.e. you know Flight Center or, or you know, CBA, there's there's a lot of great share stories where you say, well, if you'd bought, if you'd invested in the term deposit or you'd bought some shares at that time, what would have happened? Mm. And knowing the dividends and the growth and all the bits and pieces, and saying, well, where would you put your money? Oh, totally. Like and. Short term, you're better off in a term deposit. Yep. Without the risk and, and the return wasn't there. The return was guaranteed there, but over time. So it's about, you know, super is just about taking the, the super label off it and just saying yes. this is money, but this is long-term money. Yeah. This is what we do with long-term money. This is what we do with short-term money. Yep. And, and the problem, and to, to your point about people disengaged with their super, the problem is that um, 
they're conditioned to do that because every marketing agency in Australia that runs a super program isn't about opening that up and teaching people about yeah. it. It's actually saying it is that, that it's marketing barriers putting people Absolutely, in the way yeah. to say don't touch it. Correct. It's to <laughs> overcomplicate it. One of the best uh, posts I've seen recently on the on the face on the XY Advisor Facebook group was uh, Peter. Um, she she said she was talking with a client and the client contacted her existing super fund. And the super fund, I don't know if anyone saw this post, but the super fund sent out a bunch of a bunch of you know, collateral, we'll call it. And <laughs> there was about 20 different uh, pamphlets yeah. and whatnot, you know. And it was things like tax changes to your superannuation from 1st of September 2016 to the 1st of, you know, night. It, it was they do it on purpose. insanity. You, you try and read a, a, a super statement that you get from, from many of It tells you nothing you want to know. What confuses the hell out of you? <laughs> Mm. And it's there, almost like no you, need, you need a, a solution for super that helps people to engage. <laughs> with them. There's a market. I'm, I'm, I feel sure, like I'm sure. Someone's got to be synced mm. up. You know, yeah. it's yeah. someone great definitely idea. sprouting an idea as we speak. Oh. <laughs> yes. Wonder, where'd you get that idea from? <laughs> anyway, well, fun, um, funnily, that, like, um, of, you know, jokes aside, <laughs> engagement is 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 the realm of financial advisors. I, I feel like that's what that's what we do. And I met Paul um, through the AFA mentoring campaign a few years ago, um, and that's all we basically spoke about for for a long time, which was how to engage, how to engage, or how to how to get people to care. Because if also, you get people, how to, how to get you to focus, Clayton. That was <laughs> well, that's, I, don't know. I thought that was a plug for the AFA's mentoring program. But if your job was teaching Clay how to focus, clearly it's a huge failure. Yeah. <laughs> I was the a, a, AFA mentor for Clayton and ended up getting him to sell his practice and yeah. move on. So, yeah. <laughs> no, maybe not a great success. <laughs> one, one, one time we'll have. What are you doing? Why are you an advisor? Yeah, he, he goes, <laughs> are, are you an advisor or are you an entrepreneur? And I was like, <laughs> so be true to yourself, mm. um, which is great. But yeah. you talk about engagement, you talk about those things. And, and you know, and super, and, and we can blame the marketers, we can blame industry funds and all these things. A lot of the blame needs to be on advisors as well. Totally. We've mm. been conditioned in certain areas to move people from that fund to that fund, yeah. not because it makes sense, mm. because it's a fee driver for, yep. for, yeah. for, for the various layers. So you know, we really need to be careful about um, who we blame as an industry. I think we need to own that and, and solve it more as well. Yeah, um, taking responsibility. And, 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 you know, I always see myself as I need to do my bit. You know, I can't I can't do it for you, Ben. I can't, I can't do it for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my stand and I'm going to do my bit for my industry. And, um, and, Which is and, awesome, and right? And heaps of people are doing it these oh, days. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Look, and that's where, you know, you see that. There's still some anachronism, you know, sure. some old old style things out there, but you know I think advice is at a crossroads right now, and the next the next five years is going to be really really challenging for mm. a lot of people. But I also yeah. think it's going to result in in the industry um, that that should be there mm. as opposed to um, the, the 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 corporate driven. Um, one that, that that we came from, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, I think people are going to be forced to, with all these changes, to oh. either step up or step out, and mm. I think that's a mm. great thing for. Well, you say this with companies divesting their, their their wealth divisions and things like yeah. that. They 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 you know they don't do that lightly. That that's uh, yeah. they're big transactions for for the from those companies. So um, things are going to change. I, I my personal view is that that um, it will be the age of the IFA. Um, whether you're aligned or not, look, that's that's a thing. I think that's a personal decision. Um, you pick a dealer group that um, allows you to be product agnostic, you know, and that's one of our beliefs, uh, a true direction. We are product agnostic. I'm not there to sell someone's product. Yeah. I'm there to provide a financial service. That's why it's called financial services, a mm. service to people. Mm. And how, so how do you, so you're doing like corporate super cor uh, financial wellness in the workplace and helping people with their, with cash flow and those sorts of things, how do you how do you do the the engagement side? So obviously you you're working with the business to to do the super fund, but what what happens post that point? And how question. do you balance the the spread between your your cash flow and your uh, doing the super super like managing the super product? Yeah, so big questions, um, <laughs> especially for a brand new business. Uh, Come on. Look, 
<laughs> yeah, I, to be honest, Ben, we're still uh, working on that, to be okay. honest. And, and engagement, um, engagement is a big word, um, you know, and companies measure engagement all that. I, I think engagement is the um, outcome of a culture. So it's about creating a culture. So if you are in a, in a company, um, so if, if, if a company, company A is my corporate client, I need to enhance their culture. So I need to understand their culture. I need to be part of it. I need to get to the heart of what it means to, to work at that company and why the people want to be there. And then I need to use that to feed off that, grow that and enhance that. Otherwise, I'm just going to be coming, I'm, I'm going to be an outsider coming in and just saying, hey, do that. And they're going to go, mm. who the hell are you? So for me, engagement is a, uh, is, 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 a, is a result of culture. So if you can understand the culture, it, it's almost like the old iceberg. Engagement is what you see on the top, you know, and, and that's what companies measure when they do engagement surveys in, in their yeah. companies. The culture is the, the real meat of it underneath, and that's what drives it. So in terms of how w w I've always worked, it's get in there. Mm. Um, and get in there is get in with a corporate HR department and, and have yourself there. as a, get in as there. a so staff benefit. I call it about on-site and in-site. So you need to be there. Yeah. You can't just um, say there's an app and um, let me know when you've, you've come through it. They, people won't take that step. You need to have a face yeah. in, in a corporate sense. You know, It's a different type of approach. We need to be in there from the – and it's, it's top down, bottom yep. up. You meet all the new people coming through. You make sure the, the, the leadership's engaged, HR people, mm. payroll, understand what you do and then run, run workshops, programs, stalls, um, emails, f podcasts, um, webinars until something works because everyone's going to do things differently. Do you do you have a view then on because uh, I think it sounds really really wonderful, um, especially for larger businesses because you've got the capacity yeah. to deal with many people, so there's certainly scale there. Uh, do you have a view then on how big a business needs to be before the likes of yourself makes commercial sense for the business? Um, thinking of you know the the businesses out there with twenty thirty uh, people and, and yeah, absolutely, yeah, and that that's probably for my business that's going to probably be a challenge looking after that many people and, and being paid for it because it's probably not going to work, especially uh, corporate super and how you're rewarded through mm. a corporate super plan has changed uh, massively, and you know most advi most advisors who are in that space have left. Yep, and it's not some of it's been taken up by some of the, the so. I'm on the uh, committee of the uh, WSSA, <laughs> the, w, the WSSA Workplace Super Specialist Australia. So it's a it's a, a small group, but it's it's a it's a big group in terms of what it represents in corporate super. Um, it's been around for about six or seven years now, and to be a member of that, you have to be a corporate super specialist, and you know, there's rules and regulations about being in there. So, the, and they're people who are committed to taking that space forward. In terms of the size and all those sorts of things, um, it depends on your business. A lot of the, the corporate super specialists, they will have, you know, they've already got the scale and they will look after yeah, that. Absolutely. I've always been of the size where I need a company where, you know, at least a thousand staff yep. to make a difference. Um, and mm. to, Because then you've got the scale of, or of, well, not the scale, but the, 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 the difference in demographics through the company so you can deliver different services and, and mm. be able to really pinpoint on the problem areas for the company in terms of that financial stress, productivity. Because at the end of the day, the company is going to pay you to look after their staff to improve retention, attraction and productivity. That's that's what they want. That's the service. You know, they, they want a, a, a An outcome. more margin. Right? Yeah. So a, a workforce that's more focused and, and more marginal. Well, health, a healthy employees and healthy culture. Well, a balanced person who feels respected and yeah. and and and, uh, and cared for within that company. Is, it's is, just it's better on every measure. It is. Yeah. It is, but it's a challenge for companies to do it because it's a cost. Sure. You used to be able to just get uh, paid out of the super fund, mm. and it was tickety boo. You can't do that these days. Mm. Um, so it's it's a it's you you've got to really talk to the employer and make sure they see you as a service, not as a an addition to the super fund. Mm. For me, the super fund becomes a hygiene factor within the service. It's yep. what we do because we can add value in that space, yes. but it's not why you're yeah. there, which is where it sort of started from. It needs to 
to grow from there. And you add other services um, to improve your margin as a business owner, um, home loans. I mean, at, at MoneyWise, we started as advisors, but we added in you know, a, a home loan business, which was very successful, uh, a tax business. Um, we were doing tax returns, you know, simple tax returns, but that added a lot to the margin that we'd lost from, um, yeah. from, from the super fund. Um, I see the, for me, the opportunity is about getting a client base and talking to those people. And some of them will move into True Direction's private client space and become sure. and private True Direction ongoing. is the name of your business. True Direction Financial is, yeah. is the name of the business. And um, so, yeah, we, we do that and some people will want to use us. Mm. Will, will want At to that, use that us. level, but, but yeah. most importantly, you're capturing the bottom 80% who perhaps wouldn't have capacity, right? Because they, it's, does, it's not appropriate for them to pay five grand for an SOA. Because no. you're and and it's not about an SOA. It's actually about yeah, literacy half the time, cash yeah. flow, um, and and a bit of work on their super. I mean, there, there is an SOA with super, obviously, but mm. it, it becomes a, a a pretty tight document. Yeah, and I'm not. We're not there trying to put a, a twenty year old on on a on a, on a future plan. Sure. It's about look. Let's let's do what we can for you now. Um, get your focus, get you going, and then build your wealth and be there as we go on. Yeah. But more as a staff benefit, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, you've kind of touched on something that I've I kind of think about is the the eroding relevance of a of an AFSL. Um, and I think I think you've kind of touched on a lot of those things. Where if you're talking to people about cash flow and you know high level financial literacy, um, you know there still needs to be the AFSL because there's an SOA that sits at the back of the corporate super product. Absolutely. But it's, it's the last 5%. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the, the 100%. Yeah, look, at, at, um, at MoneyWise, again, we, we uh, brought in money coaches uh, quite a few years ago, um, mainly uh, because they were having low-level conversations um, and we probably, you know, and advisors are very hard to get, you know, good advisors are hard to find and just, and expensive. So, it was it was a great way to engage people, get you know, have fun coaches who were, were getting people excited about their finances and then moving them through the layers. But you still need advisors there. Um, I, I think I've seen businesses who go and do you know that that corporate wellness, but if they're not, they don't have an advice. Um, people go, well, where do I go? Because you've got them excited about something, but they, they don't know where to go. And, and so you need to have advice to take people on that yep. journey. Um, you can't just sort of educate them to a level and then go, you're on your own mm, now. Cause yeah. People aren't good if they're not accountable, right? So you need to kind of... Yeah, so so it's about having way. layers to your business and knowing, for me, it's a tailored approach to each corporate as well. I'm not going to go in and, uh, and say, here's the true direction model, um, mm. chuck it in there. Oh, it's tailored because, again, the engagement is a result of the culture, so you need to be part of the culture. So it's a tailored approach, um, go in with a diagnostic, understand where the stress points are and then some might need workshops. You know, some might, or, you know, a company might all be in Sydney here or they might be all around Australia. So there's going to be different. Um, and where, different, where different. are you having conversations with the CEO, with the MDs or, or are you focusing? Anyone on? I can at this stage. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no. So, so you know, Look, at, it, back it, in the day when you would go into a absolutely. business. Clay's just asking because he's really uh, recently given himself the title CEO. Yes. You see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be the Sprout Super Corporate Wellness <laughs> for you and Vera. Well, we have been talking. Um, <laughs> look, for me, um, it, it usually it can come through the CFO. Um, it can right. come from uh, the, at the top. HR generally is the place that you will gravitate to in, right. in these conversations because that's what they do. Do they care? Look, they care about their people. HR they do. managers and HR. Yep. Yeah, mm. yeah. Look, it's it's a tough job, HR. Mm. It's a really tough job. You know, being a HR manager, it's not just about the feel good stuff. I mean, a lot of it's trying to deal with the current IR laws and and dealing with people who are doing the wrong thing in your company. And you have enough of a company, you. you if you have 50% of your company all working in the same direction, you're pretty lucky in a large company. Generally, I find 50% are doing that. That's a good company. 25% are sort of there and there's 25% who are off the reservation, right? And that's, that's, that's a normal... So, so HR are trying to deal with this. They're trying to, you know, 
how do I say it? They're trying to suck the people who are stealing money from them or doing the wrong thing, right? Mm. And I'm, I'm very, I'm generalising there a lot. Yeah. But that, that's a HR manager's job, you know, managing risk. So it's tough. And they've also got super in their purview. They've got payroll. They've got uh, uh, recruitment. Mm. There's so many pieces. Also know? the stuff about the being an employer of choice and, right. and all that you sort know, of stuff. And the challenges. See, uh, uh, the pressure on a HR manager yeah. is massive. So if you can come in and take the super off them, work with their payroll people directly. Um, you know, w- what about when uh, work- workplace injuries and things like that? So if you have a good super uh, corporate super, you, you've got the insurance attached, right? Yeah. And, you know, income protection, those sorts of things. A good super offering has a great insurance offering. If you can take that piece off them and move people from, uh, you know, a work cover situation onto their IP if, and, and transition them across, be involved from the start with, you know, people who die on the job and things like that. I mean, these are the realities of, of a large corporate. You know, they have mm. people who die there. You know, they have people who are... In and, the office. Oh, People die every day. In yeah. offices. <laughs> yeah, but even at home. Like, there's still staff, right? There's still sure. people that are under their, their company. Mm-hmm. And Could you, you imagine a HR director dealing with a corpse? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, there, in, in an office. Do you do dead body room? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, but, Quick, you know, call, call the super guy. <laughs> but the difference between a great company and uh, who cares for their staff and, and a company that just treats their people as numbers um, is that sort of care. Yeah. You know, and, and I've worked with companies where if there's something like that happening, they call us. Wow. Right? We've got, we've got a potential claim or we've got a situation. We've, we've got one of our staff who's been diagnosed with cancer. Like, so to be that mm. trusted person in mm. their business where they come to you and you deal with the, the, you deal with the family as well, take them through that tough position. Wow. You know, and, and, you know, these these people get a million dollars life cover or whatever. What's the family going to do? I think the family, the direct family care, but in my experience, not with life insurance, but certainly with income protection. Uh, and, and if the if the HR department's been really good and we've created mm. a narrative that we've told the the staff base about, the staff actually just really appreciate the fact that you've looked after their mate. And it's like shit. You know, I don't know many employers that would do that, um, and we've we've facilitated that. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, creates a beautiful culture. We've had a client where we we actually went. To, to his funeral and um, in the in the eulogy we, we were thanked um, which I'd never, like because we, we actually sorted him he had super funds everywhere and we were able to, to, to claim early on on all his insurances you know, he was he was, he was uh, terminal um, and he was able to buy a house for his family you know, wife and two kids he was able to buy a house he'd never bought a house he'd never thought he'd be in that position and he passed away in absolute the the the, the confidence and serenity of of you know the fact that he, he left his wife and family in a house that was unencumbered and he was like happiest man <laughs> so sure. to speak yeah, yeah, um, yeah. In, in that position like he, he was at peace so there and that you know that's what an advisor does but in a corporate that is Powerful. the difference between you know, being a, a provider of, you know, a, a super fund advisor and just going in and, and um, you know, saying, here's your super and mm. come and meet me in my office um, if you want some advice or diving into the culture and enhancing it with your, your skills and, 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 and the bit you add. So the HR managers become your, your, your go-to, um, but without a CEO signing off or a CFO. And the CFOs, I find, are the ones that will um, say, well, do we really need to spend this? Could someone start a business just doing that? Just doing what? Just being uh, this culture slash uh, super sort of specialist for, for a company and and basically not take on all the administration unless it was unless unless something turned up. So you you would you would go into a, a company maybe three times a year or something um, and work on all those things that you spoke about. But a lot of that doesn't have administration on the back of it, especially if you're not... So, say, say if you're not dealing... Say if you're not looking to switch super, you're not looking to, to do all these things that are... Uh, you, say you're just using whatever's in-house and your job is just the specialist uh, to be there to educate and well, engage. 
and then, a consultant basis. Yeah. And Look, and imagine I suppose, if someone was doing that. You, you, you just had, say, uh, 10, 20 companies around yeah. the city charge 50 grand a year. They exist. They do exist. They so, do exist. So you outsource the, the, the payroll function to them, the HR function, the employee benefit function. No, I'm not even talking about that. So basically none of the stuff that uh, would take administrative burden and you just came in three times a year and engaged people... To, to reduce the stress, to, to improve productivity, yeah, things like that. It's a bit, that, 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 you could, but again, it's one of those, it, it probably wouldn't have traction over the long term. You've got to be part of it ongoing. And I suppose mm. that's what we do. One of our services is we'll come and do a diagnostic and, and do a consultancy and, you know, do a, do a survey, measure the stress, compare it against um, a database we've got and, and, and go from there and, and highlight hotspots and highlight what we could do, you know, wh- how that could be solved in different ways. Um, and then the next step would be to engage us or someone to do that. Um, right, that makes so, sense. So, yeah, you could. Um, and, I, and I suppose, to be honest, that's probably our prospecting, mm. um, our piece. That That's what we, we want to do, talk to companies about their people and a lot of companies have great financial benefits available already but they just don't utilize they're them they're so bad at talking to the staff about what they offer yeah because it's the hr person who's talking about it who's not financially minded they mm. go into hr not because you know, it's the, it's the, the the accounting or the finance arm that, that knows it and yep. it's, it's super pay the, bills. And the, <laughs> the fees are all great but the hr people are, are people people they, they just want to help people but they don't mm. know how to translate yeah. that yeah. across so one of the functions that we've done with companies in the past is is be able to maximise what they've got. Um, so share plans are the classic. So large companies will have a great share plan and, you know, offer two for one, three for one, you know. Yeah, crazy. Absolutely. Like money for jam over the long term, one of the best things you could do as an employee is invest in your company's share plan. It's tax effective and it's growth asset. If you are if you mean business and want to be there for a long time, buy into the share plan. But people don't know how to. So one of the things that I did, uh, again, at MoneyWise was, um, so again, I, I draw back to myself being a chalky on the stock exchange. I, I just have an in, I just know shares. I just know what they are. It's an innate thing that I've got, but most people don't. So I thought, how can I get people to understand shares? So the ASX um, runs a share trading game. Yep. Have yep. done for 40 years. Did that in high school in economics. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I was Great way. <laughs> Exciting people. But so I went, okay, why don't we run one of those? So we started to try and build one ourselves. And went, oh. So I approached the ASX um, and said, can you white label one up for me? And they went, probably. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, we got them to white label their um, their share trading game, uh, put that through Flight Center, um, had a big... We actually had a launch, Graham Turner, Screw Turner, who started um, Flight Center, came down to the, the Sydney and, uh, and rang the bell and we had a big... <laughs> it was fantastic. You know, we had a big launch, videoed it, put it through the company and... Um, in Australia, where what there was probably about seven thousand uh, staff, um, we had two and a half thousand f- travel agents. Wow! Playing the share market game, and not just playing, like the engagement levels um, on you know opening emails and all those things, eighty seven percent. Wow, that's astronomical. A- absolutely. Um, so you know, it was it was a it was a, it was a, a, a a com- combination of a really good idea, well executed, but also a great marketing plan around it. Mm. And our marketer there was was sensational at that, yeah. and it was it was great. We had look, we had a good prize. You know, it was ten thousand dollars worth of travel was the, was the top prize, and mm. we hung, out, hung hung that out there. But I didn't, yeah, and, and I approached a few fund managers to try and um, get them to to open up and go. Well, um, can you be part of this? And it was interesting. Some of them went, yeah, great, but we don't really want to be part of it because we don't want to be involved in day trading. I'm like, this isn't day trading. This is not turning people into share traders. What it is is demystifying the yep. share market. Yep. So it was a 10-week program where you started out going, I have, no, I have no knowledge of shares. And by the end of it, we built this program where you got exposed to more and more. And then by the end, you you knew that share prices went up and down. You knew you got dividends. You, you knew what... It, it was to, to be a shareholder. Now, the end result of that is that those 2,500 people, when you go and have a discussion about their super, 
and about moving from a balanced portfolio when they're 25 to uh, an equities-based portfolio where they should be, you, you've done all the pre-work. There's a reference point. They yeah. know. Oh, yeah, shares. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I played the game and it was fun and I understood it and I get it that it's a real thing. So it, it's... What so, could advisors do for something similar to that? Say, say if, say if uh, Ben can't get access to the ASX to... to to white label. Yeah, look, it wasn't cheap, I must say. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> could imagine. So, but I, I obviously like it and the engagement's outrageous. Um, so, wh- what do you think an advisor could do to replicate that game? Well, there was a public game twice a year that the ASX run. Yeah. And you could get people just doing that if they wanted. It, it's, it's a hard one because um, a day-to-day... Um, Getting people involved in that, it, it was tough. That's why I went down all the different routes and that's the one that I, I finalised. What could an advisor do? It depends on what client, if you're going to run it for your whole client base or, mm. or I mean, are you trying to do it? Perspective, like as a marketing campaign. With companies or with mm, individual to, clients? To retail. I think it's a different approach though, Clayton. I think that was more of a corporate engagement sure. approach. Day to day, when you're one on one with a client, you've got to sit there and you've got to have your stories. You've got to, yeah. you, you've got to be able to, you know, educate um, those clients, uh, depending on where they're at. Again, meeting them where they're at and providing a solution around that. Um, yeah, I, I don't. You know, I've met many a, a client over the years who said, oh, "I want to be a day trader. Or I want to do these things." I'm going, "Okay, well, here's some good books, but knock yourself out. I'm, I'm not taking you on that journey. You've got to Boring do that as hell." Well, you've got to do that yourself. Boring you know? as hell, day trading. Yeah, it is. But some people uh, want to do that, and that's up to them. I'm not going to judge them. But, but secretly most you're judging people, them. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm probably thinking you no know, chance, but um, I'm not judging it. Look, but the thing is, I always say, well, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. And um, Such a high yeah. percentage failure, right? Oh, yeah. It's like startup yeah. companies, you know. <laughs> 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 you know, it's a great idea, but uh, how do you execute it? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, you know, look, yeah, I don't think that's a, a, sm- a, 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 a retail approach. It's a, and that's where these, you know, the core, you need a certain size and, and, and to, to be able to run something like that just to make it pay. Yeah. yeah. There is a cool game you can get access to and it's, it's free and it's, it's stocks that are listed on Wall Street and it picks a, a random stock at a random point in time. And it says every time you click the mouse, you buy. Every time you click the mouse, you sell. So you buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. And you don't know when the game's going to finish. And, you, <laughs> and, oh, and it follows historical. And it follows historical data. Mm-hmm. So if you if you if you're a day trader and you and you know you're you're smarter than most people, have a go at this. And then mm-hmm. you start with ten grand. And at the end of it, mate, oh, you, I go broke after two minutes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, to be fair, too. that's a perfect reflection of your life as it is <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's amazing what happens though because when you start to see the market drop you're like ah, and then you know you realize that you've got out it's it it's an awesome tool for people to to realize how difficult that stuff is yeah and look and it is so difficult uh, you know so at the failure rate and that's probably why you know i know how to trade i've done it myself i've done mm. my own but i don't trade my own money I'll find it's just not link. it's just not worth it um because you uh, you miss too much Unless you're watching it all the time, you miss too much. Totally. And you can't watch it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, mate. Well, uh, how, is, is there anything that someone can, if they wanted to, you know, reach out or learn more? Because you're part of uh, One Direction, wasn't it? No. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, mate. <laughs> sorry. So, okay. True Direction. Yes. True Direction. <laughs> so, True Direction of Financial. Look, yeah, it's uh, www truedirection.com.au we've got yep. a website there um, that's our contact details myself and Kath and an outline of what we do um, the corporate piece we're building uh, at the moment so we're, we're only pretty new um, mm. we are talking to some companies at the moment but the piece on the website is more um, generic at the moment but um, that'll come yep. and again our, our approach is going to be tailored to, to each company but uh, yeah that, that's where to find me uh, cool. truedirection.com and um yeah, happy to talk to any about, anyone about this type of area of financial advice. Um, like I said I've been an advisor for a long time. I've been exposed to a, a lot of things yeah. over the years. And um, I am a true believer, but I also think, you know, we do need to um, make sure we're, we're, we're pushing forward in our own areas and, and, and hold it, waving that flag because there's too much bad news out there about us and um, mm. it's, it's not right. Totally. Mm. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, really guys. Appreciate it. Cheers, Paul. Cheers. Enjoyed the talk. Cool. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>
Jeez. <laughs>